but okay um welcome to our second lunching with leaders event this is the foundation's new lunchtime speaker series where once a month we invite powerful women of color in the philanthropic and nonprofit sectors to share their knowledge and connect with other women of color leaders. We hope that this can serve as both an informative and collaborative space where women of color leaders can network with each other and share their experiences. My colleague and interviewer for today's luncheon is Brandy Howard, our chief of staff, and she will introduce Susan and begin the uh, interview. Welcome. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, and thank you all for joining us for this lunch. Um, you, thank you all you leaders for joining us during this lunch hour. Um, I do wanna say we're gonna um, really kind of hold this space as we normally do um, in community, in conversation. So me and Susan will be in kind of conversation, but please utilize the chat. Um, and be, you know, wanting to jump into conversation and discussion um, at the conclusion of me and Susan's short little um, conversation together. Um, before we get started, um, I'm just going to um, ask everybody if you can check in um, via the chat. So if you can just take a moment, put your name, your pronouns, your organization, um, and maybe one um one thing that you are looking forward to in this fall, um, anything that has associated with rest and joy that you are waiting for in the fall. So I'll put that your name, pronouns, organization, and one thing around rest or joy that you're looking forward to in the fall season. Um, so I'm gonna pause from talking and let you put that in probably for like 30 seconds, um, just so we can also see who we're all in community with. And while I also put my information in here. All right, I guess I should have said who I was in the beginning. I'm sorry, Brandy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Retha Robinson, I'm the director of the Kasha program at the San Francisco Foundation and the interim director of the Power Pathway, uh, Grant Making Pathway, uh, and part of the leadership team that's hosting this event. So. So I just had to put in, I'm just going to put it, you know, little facilitators prerogative. I'm looking forward to all things squash. I love curry, pumpkin curry, squash curry. Oh, I'm currying it up with all the, <laughs> all the squashes this fall. That brings me a lot of joy. Um, so I do want to just, before we get started, just really thank um, my colleague, Yolanda, who's on the team, on the screen, Yolanda Alindor, Rita Robinson, um, Sayron, who's not on, Michelle Miles Chambers, and so many other amazing women of color. And then I have to say Perry Wong and Brandon Johns, who are the men behind the scenes who are really supporting our women of color, and women of power program, um, and what has created this space for us today. I'm really um, very thankful. I'm trying not to get distracted by this chat. I am loving it. Um, <laughs> let me just go and turn that off. I am really excited about the opportunity to have a conversation with Susan um, Batten. Um, if you know me, you will know that I am a huge fan of APFI, the Association of Black Foundation Executives. Um, APFI is the oldest membership organization focused on um, really bringing race, um, di well, before we talked about diversity and inclusion, but really calling out the specificities of race and the importance of um, being clear around race and philanthropy and the impact that we need to have for communities of color, specifically for Black communities. And so, and really set the tone to do this in a way that was in solidarity and really laid the foundation for so many other um, membership organizations like AFI to come along and support communities of color in this sector. And so um, it is a, a, an honor to be in conversation with you, Susan. Susan has been leading APFI for the past 13 years, and I don't know what the secret sauce is, but it is a place that every time I engage with APFI, I am changed for the better. Um, and so I'm looking forward to this conversation, and I hope that you are soon. Um, and so before I, 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 we get deep into 
I just want to ask you, Susan, if you can share a little bit about your leadership journey. Um, and if you would share anything around what was most insightful or impactful um, through your journey in, in philanthropy. And I know, um, and I, I don't want to just hold and I know you'll share this, but AFI is not your first. You spent years at Casey. You've always, right. you had a career of caring for community um, yeah. and a career of service. And so if you just speak to that um, and also just speak to um, what inspired you in your field to choose philanthropy as a place that you continue to serve. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Brandy, and the full team at the San Francisco Foundation. Thanks for uh, inviting me to come speak with you all. And I am, every time the sort of doorbell rings, I get excited. We've got a, a pretty big group here, uh, so, so this is exciting. Uh, yeah, I've been at AFI for, for 13 years now, but what's interesting, um, my background is public service, actually. I, I really started out in uh, government. Um, and I, and I think it's really, you know, um, a little bit brandy about who I am. Um, I'm a social worker by training. Uh, I came out of, of, uh, HBCUs, um, and, um, Howard with a master's in social, social work and, and started my career in child welfare. And, uh, really thought that that would be sort of the focus of my, my work um, until I got tapped by a search firm um, that worked in the field of philanthropy. And, and um, I chose to make the transition. And, and you know, it's, um, I come from a family of, uh, I would say helping professionals. My dad was a longtime educator in New York City. Um, my mom was a community health nurse. My sisters were teachers. So it was a little bit of who I was, um, you know, inspired by my sister really to, to become a social worker. Um, but there was something about, you know, uh, careers in uh, public service and working in big public systems that suggested to me philanthropy may be the right next step. And I know we're going to talk a lot about it because I was most interested in changing broken systems that impact um, our community. Uh, so I, I got a, a, uh, a sort of nod from a search firm to, to move into the field and, and started as a really a consultant um, in the field um, and then on to the Annie Casey Foundation, as you said, for about 10 years and, and now um, at Abfi. So, so that's um, a little bit of my, my journey. Yeah. Well, thank you, Susan. I didn't know we had that in common because I'm also a social worker by training. Really? Yeah. So really? that's always a beautiful thing. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm part of my, um, my own philosophy when I come to the work is I change systems with a focus on people who are either maintaining or dismantling. And yes. so I'm either yeah. trying to help shift people who yeah. are maintaining this system and showing that there's a different way. And for those who dismantling, you know, I'm trying to be a co-conspirator. Um, so we're going to work together and shift um, the system. It. So I did not know we had that in common. So yeah. another, see, I tell you, every time I engage with you, it's always That's something right. new and um, I'm loving it. You know, um, it, it's interesting just in terms of uh, philanthropy, you know, we're just coming out, of course, of Black Philanthropy Month, August. Um, and so many of us were out speaking and, and the like. Um, reminding folks that philanthropy is really about the love of humanity. And so those of us who are in, you know, the social work arena, those of us who feel like we are here to help others, which is why I think we're fundamentally here, philanthropy is just a, a, a good alignment. I would say a strong alignment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and, you know, one of the things I, I think about when we think about philanthropy, you know, I, I think about um, it wasn't how you approach the work and how you approach your role in the work has a lot to do with um, the impact, your love for humanity. Mm -hmm. um, not always, that was not the origin story. Um, and so I find myself committing daily or needing to recommit daily to the contradiction that I sit within a mass wealth and the mass um, oppression and need, particularly in our communities. Yeah. Um, and so when we think about um, our contributions to the systems, how um, how do you think about the importance and the contribution of Black leadership and philanthropy and the ability to change systems in the community? 
um, and the sector overall? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, much of what we do at AppV is care about and uh, continue to focus on diversity in the sector, right, to ensure that Black leaders have opportunities to do just that, to lead. And, um, you know, while, as you said earlier, we have to go beyond diversity, um, you know, just who we are as a people and and um, what our families, you know, not just communities, but families um, have experienced. I think we bring a, a, a important perspective, a lived experience um, as leaders uh, in, in this sector. So, you know, I get I get really excited. I, I love to support those of you that are actually leading in philanthropy because you all are doing the hard work and we're trying at Abby just to organize and provide space for networking and support because it's tough out there to do important work for black communities and communities of color. But but I see black leadership um, bringing their lived experience, bringing their passion, Brandy, um, and again, their proximity to these issues. Um, too many of us have you know, had experiences, our families have had experiences with broken systems. And so this is um, not about a job for us, right? This is about sort of um, survival for, for our kids, our families, our, our you know, moms and dads. And so uh, the, the work that is happening, and, I, and I'm gonna focus in on Black Foundation CEOs in particular, we're about to just FYI, we're about to publish a report on the work of Black Foundation CEOs, and I see a few in the room. Um, I'm just blown away by the innovation, by the strength, um, by the commitment to systems change and power building uh, that, that our colleagues are doing. So we bring, we bring lived experience, we bring proximity, and, and we're bringing real intention and, and brilliance, quite frankly. Yeah, you know, I, I really love the fact that you talked about our experience and proximity. You know, I, um, again, people who know me, <laughs> and if you don't, you will after this, I always lead. I'm a third generation um, native Oaklander, mm. which for me, if you're from this area, you know, that's really rare to find, and I still live here. Mm -hmm. um, but I had, I have, I say had, because she's passed, but it's always with me. My mom was a very strong woman. Everybody knew her in community. She tutored. She mm -hmm. disciplined, and um, but she also was on social services. And yeah. I never forget the moment I went with her to get her food stamp card mm -hmm. and the way she was spoken mm -hmm. to and the way that she had to just suck that up because yeah. she knew she needed to feed us. And it just like depleted her. Yes. And then she had to leave out and try to build herself back up. And yeah. I was so hurt that day. Yeah. Yeah, that I it, it kind of like lit a fire and I was ready to fight. I was like, yeah. so it that's what like started my fight. Like, how dare you do that? Yeah. And I never yeah. forget that feeling. Um, I can still remember the faces, but it's that feeling that the dignity that yeah. systems try to take from us that I refuse. And that's kind of like the start of like why it's so important. And it reminds me when I get tired and want to like just like, you know, let me fold up and just stay in my little corner of why it's so important for us to continue to be in that game. So I love it around the experience and the proximity because, you know, you might not remember the story, but a feeling you will never forget. It's so interesting that you say that. I'm the youngest of four and, you know, born and raised in Long Island, New York. And I was the, I was the only one that was born outside of Brooklyn. The rest of my siblings were born in Brooklyn. I was um, not old enough to remember Brandy, but I remember my sisters telling the story about how my mom would change her personality when during that tough period in my family's life, she had to sort of, you know, hand over her public assistance card to go grocery shopping. There was a period where, you know, it was just a tough period for my family. I didn't see it. I'm listening to you and your story, but my sisters saw it. And, and hearing them talk about it, um, the shame that my mom felt, and I would never think my mother was a shameful person about anything, right? She was a very proud person. So yeah, when we say this is about our proximity, this is lived experience, um, this isn't a job. This is about, again, making things better for our people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that too. Um, so it just really resonated with me. And I just want to just if for a moment, if you can share for those who are not familiar, I love that um, the way you talk about how AFI really supports us that are in the work every day. Can you share a little bit about all the different ways AFI support leaders in the sector? Yeah, yeah. So um, our work really falls into three buckets, if you will. Um, the first is philanthropic advising. Right. So, and this comes from Brandy, my direct experience of working at the Andy Casey Foundation when we were trying to move that very big and important organization along its journey around racial equity and racial justice. Um, we really found that, you know, customized advising, coaching, and technical assistance was absolutely necessary. Right. Many of us that sit in large foundations, wealthy foundations, we go to conferences. You know, we have the opportunity uh, to be educated around these issues, but, you know, when the rubber hits the road, often folks are not sure exactly what to do if they want to move a racial justice agenda. So one way in which we support colleagues in the field is to bring in our advisors. Um, we built a film, a philanthropic advising arm at Abbey just about six or seven years ago. There are a lot of philanthropic advising arms in the sector. None are black led. Um, when we think about the big names, the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, the McKinsey's and all that. And I wanted to build something that was, you know, sort of rooted in black community um, for the for the foundation um, sector. So philanthropic advising is one body of work. Um, networking is is another. And as simple as that sounds, um, you know, um, and many of us on this on this call know um, and the program around women of color knows that um, we are still struggling, you know, in big, big ways around diversity and inclusion, right, in the sector. And so just providing space, just providing space for Black professionals to get together. I was on a call yesterday with about 10 Black leaders from community foundations around the country that run um, Black funds, right, um, that have been developed, I would say, post the murder of George Floyd. And it happens at every at the event. When Black folks get into the room, they feel safe. They feel like they are there to actually nurture and support each other. They can be authentic. So networking is a huge, you know, sort of body of work for us. And it's similar to our, our colleagues, Hispanics in philanthropy, Native Americans in philanthropy, providing those spaces for folks of color to be their authentic selves um, and, and, and really get that support. And then research and advocacy is the third bucket of our work at AFB. And we try to stay on the issues again of who has the opportunity to lead in this sector and as importantly, where the money is going in this sector, right? So we continue to provide our colleagues um, in, in the field with information in, in those two areas. So, you know, high level that that's really the, the work of the organization. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to actually tap to this other question really quick, because there's something I know many um, folks, I don't know about on this call, but many people that I've engaged with in the sector have um, been able to build up their leadership with AFI. Mm -hmm. um, and your fellowship has been a space of really um, bringing leaders together. So um, I want to ask this question of like, how do we collectively, really speaking about your Connecting Leaders um, Fellowship Program, which again has been really dynamic over many years, um, how do we think about um, building that bench or building the pipeline of leaders of color in philanthropy? Like who's doing that now? Yeah, it's really important. Uh, it's an important question. You know, I got connected to ABFI, um, because of the Connecting Leaders Fellowship Program. Um, you'll hear us refer to the CLFP, right? The Connecting Leaders Fellowship Program. And just to give you a real quick backstory, Brandy, and then I'll share my thoughts about your question. Um, as mentioned, I was at the Annie Casey Foundation. We were starting our work around racial equity and racial justice. This is about 2004, 2005. It was a big, body of work and it was not easy. It was a bit messy if I were to be honest. Um, and I actually took the position as the first senior associate on racial equity and racial justice at the Casey Foundation. So I had the responsibility of helping that big foundation 
begin its agenda in this area. And it was overwhelming. It was um, the universe actually speaking um, that that was the year I got my APU fellowship. I was in the first class of the Connecting Leaders Fellowship Program, right? So this is like 2004, 2005. And it's a very intentional program that's about the, you know, uh, professional mobilization, career development of what we call what we call mid-career African Americans in the field of philanthropy, right? Um, the CLFP um, a lot, uh, participants get um, executive job coaches for a year. They get matched up with um, mentors and sponsors for the year. They're coordinated uh, every month, uh, now virtually, of course, um, you know, to, to sort of share with their peers. And I will tell you, um, every year, now we've been running this program for since 2004, we've got close to 200 alumni around the country. Every year when we name a new cohort, and we're about to name a new cohort now, um, of the 10, about half of them are ready to leave the field already. And they've only been in the field for about three to four years because of how tough it is, right, to be a person of color, particularly leading on issues of racial justice in some of these, big, you know, very major, big institutions or, quite frankly, small family foundations or community foundations where there is little to no diversity. So this is extremely important. Um, we find that, um, well, the way I talk about it, Brandy, is I don't, I don't necessarily think we have an issue of a pipeline or a pipeline problem. I think we have a retention problem in this sector. I see the talent coming in every year. We're tapping, every year we put out the call for nominations for this Connecting Leaders Fellowship Program. We get 40 to 50 applicants a year. We only take 10, right? So the need is far greater. And I'm just talking about the black population. I'm not talking about the population of color, right? In the sector. The need far outweighs the capacity that we have. Um, but as I mentioned, when colleagues come into this program, many of them are ready to leave the sector already. So um, these kinds of fellowship programs are important for retention. Uh, we actually have this, this program that we've talked about. Hispanics and Philanthropy has a fellowship program. There are many affiliated with the Change Philanthropy um, and some of you may know Change, it's a coalition of 10 philanthropy serving organizations like ABFI, like Hispanics and Philanthropy, Native Americans and Philanthropy, EPIP, Emerging Practitioners in Philanthropy, you know, is critical to the pipeline, but I would say more critical to the retention. So that, that's what I offer to, to this sector and to this conversation. I see the talent coming in, we can't keep it. And you know, we did a we did a report, Brandy, like in 2015, 2016, and it keeps getting referenced, even though it's old. It's called the exit interview. Mm -hmm. And it's when we interviewed about a hundred former black program officers about why they left the sector, right? Um, and it's very clear that the lack of support, you know, the lack of opportunities for professional development, the lack of networking. Uh, all works against um, young Black professionals, younger Black professionals, and I would say professionals of color. So I think we've got to get intentional around the fellowship programs that are that are in existence, We pro and we need more. I think we need more to actually hold on to the talent. Yeah, thank you. That is um, so true. Um, oh, thank you. Um, looking at, you have a, a there's a, a a chat there. Um, we don't have a pipeline. We have an attention retention, and I think that is like really um, spot on. And I know Crystal understand this is you know, a leader um, and leading in a way that's um, around equity. I want to just you know we spent a little time kind of sharing a little bit about Athi and your yeah. why, um, the importance of you know uh, black leadership to maybe shift the change in systems and organization and why important how why it's important to support this leadership. And I love that. I feel like that should be something we should be hashtag. It's not a pipeline problem, it's a retention problem. Like that is so critical. Um, I know we were gonna spend some time really talking about um, power building and the importance of it. And I want us to get into that. But, you know, Susan, as we talk through these questions, if you, you know, have insights and, you know, folks, please use the chat to pose your questions. My colleagues will help us to kind of fill those. 
and we'll open it up for discussion so we can continue to talk through this. But I would love to hear, like, what are you hearing also from Black leaders in the space as we talk about, particularly in this moment, when we're talking about building power, we're talking about this work towards racial um, and racial justice, but more, more a, a just and racialized um, and racially just future. Um, what are some of the challenges of just working in philanthropy um, that you're hearing and things that we need to be paying attention to, connecting and really galvanizing around? Um, I think it's important. It's a really important piece to this conversation as well. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Okay, gosh, there's so much. There's so much there, Brandy. Um, I will never be first, I'll say. I, I will never underestimate um, how many colleagues, well-intentioned colleagues in this sector uh, don't understand the history of this country. Um, and um, particularly as it relates to how, how uh, the government, the country itself aided in the, you know, sort of disparate sort of um, outcomes that we see today. I, I know the, the colleagues that we speak, you know, uh, to all the time at AFI, the probably all, you know, the, the folks on, on the call today um, understand, um, and that might seem so elementary and simple, but um, I, am, I am never surprised by the um, lack of understanding about how this country has used power and policy to marginalize and control black people and other people of color, right? Um, so so um, some of what we hear is uh, what folks don't know. Our, our members are, you know, the leadership that, that, that is connected to, to APFI, um, talk often about what people don't know, you know, and, and think about it, right? I always say, um, one of the things we advocate, Brandy, is, you know, if you're working in the South Side of Chicago and, and you want to do good, you know, um, as relates to communities on the South Side, um, you know, you might want to spend some time looking at how the South, South Side of Chicago got to be the South Side of Chicago, right? Um, like, how did it actually happen that, you know, over a period of time, I tell the story about Ferguson, actually, when we were doing some work in Ferguson after Michael Brown was murdered, right? How a, a suburb of St. Louis, right? Not a major urban area, how a suburb of St. Louis um, over about a decade um, became, you know, um, over-policed with failing schools and predominantly black, right? Like that just didn't happen overnight. That was intentional. Um, and people will argue about whether or not it was intentional policy decisions, right, that drove those conditions um, and ultimately the outcomes, right, for, for Black people in particular in, in Ferguson, Missouri. So, so one of the things that I guess I hear, not only from folks that, that are in our network, but for the folks that we are working with, as I say, we do a philanthropic advising. So we're in the boardrooms, we're in the boardrooms of philanthropy every day right, um, predominantly in boardrooms of folk that don't look like us, teaching folks about this country, right, and, and how things ultimately got to be the way they are. Um, that's one. I guess the other big one is that <laughs> um, whether or not there's real intention to change things, you know, um, I worry sometimes, and, and we're a big organization, not real big, but, you know, an organization that does training, does technical assistance, does a lot of consulting and advising. Um, I worry, Brandy, that um, uh, some, some are in it for the experience and not necessarily to change you know, what happens. Uh, we're trying to change thinking and behavior, right? We're trying to change grant-making practice. And there comes a time when you know, you've had support, you've been trained up, you've read 20 million books, Right, um, you talk to community. Um, there comes a time when you you have to change things, and you know the slowness of change um, really is frustrating and stresses you know so many of us out. But you just wonder. Uh, I think it was a California Foundation, the Liberty Hill Foundation in L.A. that I first heard use the tagline, "We're about change, not charity." I think there's just so much 
about this sector, well-intentioned, <laughs> but about this sector that is about charity and not change. So I, if I had to sort of, like, what do we hear? Um, those would be the two, the sort of two big buckets. Folks don't know um, the history of this country, um, may not want to know, folks don't know. And the other is um, just really questioning, you know, um, is philanthropy about changing the conditions, right? Um, really fixing broken systems, um, or is it about charity? Hmm, that's so powerful. Thank you. That is very powerful. You know, when I think about, um, you know, I, I do want us to, and we have some really good questions and I'm letting everybody know that my colleagues are taking those and we'll really dig into those at the top of our discussion in Q&A section. So they will get um, responded to, please just keep them coming. Um, you know, you really spoke to like the importance around change, but the, the, the connection back to um, understanding the history. Um, and that's powerful in itself. You know, I know Angela Glover Blackwell yeah. just did this piece at Bioneers when she talked about going back and understanding the history. Is it something um, we need to do? It's necessary for us to actually make any movement source change. Mm -hmm. Like it is absolutely vitally necessary. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, thinking about that um, and thinking about the power building work, if you can like really just speak to, and I would want you, you've been talking about this, I think all along, <laughs> you know, just about power and self, power and role and the power that we need to, um, and the power building we need to do both in philanthropy. And a lot of people in the audience are um, folks that are in the community, leading and working in community organizations that are in closer proximity, right? That to the problems every day. If you can talk a little bit about like the importance of power building, from the philanthropic perspective? And then how do we get philanthropy to do real authentic funding of power building on the ground? Yeah, yeah. So um, the importance of power building, you know, it's um, Rashad Robinson, Color of Change. I think of him when, whenever I think about a definition of, of you know, um, what's power. And he said, power is the ability to make the rules. Right, those in power get to make the rules, and power is what changes things. It, it's it's what fuels substantive change. So, um, again, if if we're if we are if we've got some shared agreement that uh, big public systems policy in this country, right, has played a major role in marginalizing and controlling Black people, people of color. Um, we've got to build power to to change that, right? Um, power concedes nothing without demand. I'm going to start quoting people. Rashad mm -hmm. Robinson, that's for Big Douglas, actually. <laughs> never has, never will, right? Um, so, it, so it's extremely important. And when I talk about, um, you know, some of the important work of um, uh, Black leaders in this sector, of, at, at Crystal being one, I mean, the work that's happening you know, around the country um, by Black leaders to build power um, is, is exciting, important, and we want more people, right, more funders to actually engage. At, at Abdi, um, and I'm going to share a document with you, Brandy, that maybe we can share with colleagues that are on the phone, but we, we talk about uh, building different kinds of power. We talk about at Abdi, building political power, which is actually the ability to you know, influence legislation, policy, and the like. We talk about building economic power, right? Which is about building wealth. Um, we say there is no racial justice without economic justice, right? We talk about building institutional power. I think that's the work that so many of us are in right now, which is about strengthening Black-led and focused organizations or the ecosystem, right? Of um, of uh, power building and and movements um, in in our country, and so it's 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 critically important. You know what what we try to do is um, uh, one. We're not a grantor. We we try to put out frameworks. We have a framework called Responsive Philanthropy in Black Communities that that is really about you know ways in which foundations should be investing in power building, be it institutional power, the building political power, uh, building economic power. Uh, we also talk about um, 
uh, social power, which is around narrative and communications change, the power to change how people think, right? So we put out frameworks. Um, we try to lift up the, the power building investments that are happening. I'm always, um, and because I, I got Crystal on my mind talking about the Democracy Frontlines Fund. I mean, that the work that's happening by Black leaders in California in particular, uh, I think about the California Freedom Fund, right, housed at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, for example. Um, and there's one in Southern California, I think it's the Black Equity Collective. Uh, there, are, there are great examples around um, not only your state, but around the country uh, where funders are, you know, investing and many are Black funders. Um, and I would say um, Latino funders in particular are investing in power building. Um, and you know, I think because we are a philanthropy serving organization, as I say, we're not a funder, um, we try to help the sector understand the importance of power building as a strategy. I, you know, I, I still think we have have to go there, um, helping people understand the, the, the strategy of power building and why that matters to systems change. We don't think we can sustain systems change um, without power in our communities, right? To, to fuel it and to sustain it over time. So we try to do, you know, grant making education and we try to put funders in room with funders that are movement funders uh, to help build their competency and skill. There are other organizations um, in the philanthropy serving space like um, Neighborhood Funders Group actually that's got Great programming, um, National Committee on Responsive Philanthropy, their Power Moves framework. Um, we're all talking about it. And, and Hispanics and Philanthropy is about to kick off a major power initiative, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so it's it's getting this work out there, lifting it up, helping you know, more funders understand power building as, as a strategy. And also um, acknowledging that, you know, building power again is about change. And so we, are, we have to continue to push on whether or not the sector is really about that, if it's really about change. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna hold and really sit with, I'm loving all the quotes. I'm over here just, just jotting, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> power is the ability to make the rules. I'm like, that's, that's all, you know? And I think many of us come to this work as rule breakers. Mm -hmm. um, is because it's like, that's the power I have around a rule is to break the ones that don't work for me or right. work for my people. Right. Um, but we actually need to be in the place where we can create collective rules and have that mm -hmm. collective power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, power seeds nothing without demand. And that's where we are in partner with our nonprofit community members and leaders. And, and so just really thank you. And then to really move from charity to change. This work is about change. And so I'm going to see the my last minute to open this conversation up because I have some really good questions and I want to make sure that folks can, we can, um, I'm going to hand it over to the um, facility, the group, um, the Women of Color, Women of Power team to help us to go through some of the questions that came in the chat and then we'll open it up if we have time to a few other questions for people to come off mute. Um, and we'll go into a quick discussion and then I have one question that I will want us to kind of wrap up our conversation with before we hand it back to um, Yolanda um, Allendorf. So, okay, yeah. I think, oh, you love, I've been collecting, I have three of the questions. Okay, go ahead, Rita. Okay, um, the first question, um, how do you see the impact of the work with the challenge of talent retention? Um, you know, uh, every year when the Council of Foundations puts that data out about um, how we're doing in the field vis-a-vis -vis diversity, um, I'm just sort of, you know, on pins and needles. Um, the last few reports suggest we're not doing that well as it relates to retention in the middle. We are actually in a place, um, and it's funny, as, as, you know, folks of African descent, where we are celebrating um, a moment where we've got more Black Foundation CEOs. And in California, sometimes I just want to move out there because y'all are rolling more Black Foundation CEOs that, than, than we've had um, ever and sitting on top of some really big foundations, right? Sitting on top of some really big foundations. But colleagues, what the data suggests is that while that's growing, we're losing Black program officers. 
we're losing folks in the middle, what I, what I was you know, defining as the middle. And, and part of that, again, is what we are learning and hearing from our Connecting Leaders Fellows that are in big, non-diverse right, organizations that aren't moving with urgency on issues related to Black people and Brown people, right? Um, so I think we are um, challenged, quite frankly. And, um, you know, while I, I mentioned that there were a number of fellowship programs around, I think they have to be further, I think we have to do a better job of structuring them so that they're um, more interconnected. We're learning lessons from them. Um, uh, and they're funded. They're funded to go to scale. When I say that we turn away more than half of the applications that we get every year from brilliant, brilliant Black minds, right? Um, I know we're turning away one more sister or brother who might leave. I know it. So um, we've got a lot of work to do there. I could go on, but I'm not going to take as much time to. Um, here's another question, which is aligned to what you just said. Um, what are the opportunities to develop and fortify the pipeline from nonprofits to fill to nonprofit organizations to philanthropy to help address those challenges in retention? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And and quite frankly, um, you know, if I had a magic wand, I'm I'm sure we would change a whole bunch of things <laughs> to strengthen what is a good sector to make it great. Um, I would like to see more requirements that to lead in the foundation, you have had to let a nonprofit, you have had to been on the other side, right, of the grant making scheme, um, you know, applying for funds and the like, um, because that that's a that's a huge struggle that that I that I have um, is that so many of the, you know, the, the, the great leaders actually um, have not been on the grant recipient side. And uh, I think that should be more more valued. I think there's opportunity though. Um, I think that um, one, because that's a strength and asset that we should see show up in position descriptions for leadership, quite frankly, in foundations and grant making institutions. And I would say there's a lot more focus, um, good news about what's happening. There's a lot more focus in the field on um, uh, people of color led nonprofits. I think foundations, Rita, are building those relationships you know, in, in 2020, um, you know, two, three months after George Floyd was murdered, our phone was ringing off the hook. Foundation just wanted to know where are the black led organizations? We don't know any, right? That's right, we don't know any, right? Um, and I would hope that now folks may know a few more, not a whole <laughs> lot, but a few more. Um, so the relationships are there, right? Um, so it's hard enough to get in this sector right? Because these jobs are often difficult to navigate how you get into philanthropy. I bet you we all got different stories that are in foundations. But in terms of lifting from the grantee base, you know, and engaging nonprofit leaders, I think is a real opportunity. And we could organize, I see easily strategies to do that. Yeah. Great. And I have one more. Um, how do you begin a conversation that is deep and centuries long with folks who don't know our history, don't know that they don't know our history and may be resistant to the change that we need. Yeah, it's um, it's a, it's a question that I struggle with um, every day that um, I I ask some of my team to to be in those rooms, mm -hmm. to be in those rooms. Um, this work and and you know when we're talking about um, black professionals in the sector, um, uh, women of color in the nonprofit and philanthropy sector, we gotta talk about rest and healing. Brandy started that. Um, she started our conversation off in that way. But I, but I, um, one way I respond, Rita, is um, to say that uh, when we do it, we, we've got to be ready to support the folks that are in these rooms, these boardrooms, trying to educate people about the country that they live in, right? We have to be able to support them because you come out of those rooms, particularly as a person of color, all messed up. I don't know how else to describe it, all messed up, right? And tired and a bit and, and hurt, you know? Um, I don't do trainings that much anymore, but when I did, um, it would wipe me out. So I will say, 
I, I, I do think that our um, efforts uh, pay off. We can walk into a room and we can easily spot, I know you all can as well, um, who's, who's movable. We always, mm -hmm. you know, we often divide groups into those that are movable and those that aren't. And how you focus on those that are movable. We try to screen before we even go into rooms, whether or not they're movable or not, right? And I've seen light bulbs go off. I, I actually have. I've seen things change within our client base. So I don't want to throw it all out, um, but it's hard work. And the only other thing I would add is that we have to care for those that are doing it. Yeah. Great. The only thing else I need to say is someone asked, um, are the, will the transcript be available? And this meeting is being recorded. So we will make sure that happens. So Brandy, you want to ask your last question? Yeah, well, actually, I'm a, I'm a twofold. You know, if you, if you haven't noticed, I love my twofold questions because I, I really love this way of like how really just acknowledging how hard, how sometimes emotionally and sometimes even spiritually taxing this is to be a leader um, leading at every at every level, um, racial justice work in philanthropy and in our sector, um, in the nonprofit sector. And so I think about, you know, now we're at a moment in time that many people have said, have said to me and elders have never seen before. And these are people who've been in this work 40, 50 years. Um, and we're also in a place at this time where we're having multi-generational leadership. Um, and younger generations at the helm of many of this work that is have a different vision, a different level of audaciousness, and really stretching many people, I would say, even in my generation, to think differently about what's possible and what's not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, first of all, I just want to say it is a beautiful tension. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful tension mm -hmm. if we just embrace it and submit to it. That's mm -hmm. all I can say. That's all I can do is <laughs> just embrace it and yeah. submit to the beautiful tension of really working for racial economic justice in a multi-generational space. So I would want to close us um, and um, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self as you start this journey um, of liberation? And uh, that's my word I'm putting, but my experience of you and everything that you shared is really a journey around um, justice, freedom, and liberation. So what would you tell your younger self? Wow. Um, <clears throat> stay focused on mission and don't take it personally. Um, reach for those positions that make you stretch and make you learn. Because personally, for me, I think that's how I moved. Um, I was always just a little under what I should have known when I took that next job. <laughs> um, and, and I think the other thing that's important uh, for younger Susan to know is um, make sure that it's something that you love. Um, otherwise, it's just a job. And and jobs come and go and 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 um, so make sure that it's something that you love. There's another question about Apfi that I want to um, yeah. ask Susan. Um, does or has Apfi worked with local governments in any way to support investment of public dollars? You know, I'm trying to think. Um, we have not worked directly with local government. It is something that we're really thinking about more now given the infusion of money most recently, right? With um, uh, COVID relief money um, and infrastructure dollars. Um, we, we work with funders with a very clear message that, and, and this is my personal opinion, Rita, that um, philanthropy is the small money to change the big money, right? The big money's public systems. Um, but because of just, I, I think it's been mostly capacity um, and infrastructure, we've stayed in the lane of funders. We do work very closely with groups like Race Forward that runs um, GARE, 
uh, uh, oh my gosh, it's a network of um, local governments that are sort of focused on racial equity. And they've called us in from time to time um, just to talk strategy and the like. Um, but we, but that's not been our um, our lane to date. Yeah. Well, Susan, I thank you so much. Um, and I, I love this last um, comment that is in the chat. Um, and it reminds me of Dr. Ken Hardy of understanding the task of the privileged and the task of the subjugated. It is not our work to do for others. Um, and so that staying focused on the mission is really critical. So thank you whoever put that because that's the that's the task forward, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, organizations, you cannot change systems unless you're willing to change the people in them. So that self-work mm -hmm. is critical. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, so thank you for ending with that. Thank you so much, Susan, for just yeah. all the gems. And I said, every time I engage with you and AFI overall, I leave better than where I started. So I have so much to think on. The question and comments of each and every one of you in the audience have been just like very deep, really speaking that truth. And so I look forward to reading the transcript and hopefully we get these um, chat notes in there too, because there's some gems in here. Um, again, thank you all so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to um, the team member, Yolanda Allendor, who will um, continue the program forward. Again, thank you so much, Susan. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Brandy. And thank, and thank you, Brandy. Exactly. So thank you so much for a great conversation. Um, I'm Yolanda Lindor, and I'm a senior program officer and part of the leadership team at the San Francisco Foundation that is hosting this event. So thank you all for being with us. One of our goals in hosting this event um, is to support the request of our women of color leaders that we hear often about their wanting to network more deeply with, uh, with each other. So in this next section, we're going to um, give you an opportunity to get to know each other by randomly assigning you to small breakout groups. You'll only have about five people in each group. And we just invite you to introduce yourselves to each other, talk a little bit about your work, share your contact information if you'd like to. And, uh, and if you have a little extra time, it's gonna be only about 10 to 12 minutes. You have a little extra time, feel free to, um, to uh, discuss a bit about these many amazing insights we've heard from uh, Susan this morning. So um, with that, Perry, uh, please help us get folks into their groups and we'll see you all back here in 10 minutes. And we'll try to do at least a couple rounds of these before we break up. Perry.